At the heart of horror, there has always been more than spooks and scares. Sometimes, it's not what you see, but what you hear. Welcome to Sound Scary. Each week, we talk to the artists, the musicians, the fans, the people who haunt the shadowy corners of your mind. Join us as we delve into the deepest, darkest, and most unforgettable earscapes. Welcome to Sound Scary. to another episode of Sound Scary Quarantine Edition. I'm your host, Ryan Coltrera, and today I'm super excited to talk to our guests. But first, I'm gonna pass it over to my co-host. Yes, I, I, you know what, I am too. And again, I say it all the time, I love our guests. I love our guests so much. But this one's real special because I happen to absolutely adore the Conjuring movies. And there's a new one coming out called The Conjuring. The devil made me do it. And we have, we're so honored, so honored to have the director of that film, right in the house with us, Michael Chavez. Thank you so much for joining us. It's amazing to have you on. Thank you guys. I am so excited to be here and just so excited to talk to you guys and talk Conjuring. Yeah, <laughs> well, okay. So when I first saw the opening with you over at the lot, I was blown away. I've seen the movie. I'm blown away. I really, <laughs> really, truly enjoyed this. I, I it, it's it's shocking to me how complicated it must be to maneuver through these an already established world, and you did it. You did this really unique and really refreshing take on the Warrens. How do you feel? I mean, it, now that's happening, and now that people are starting to see it. How are you feeling about it? <laughs> oh, I feel great. I, you know, honestly, um, you know, it's been just a huge journey. And, you know, I, you know, without a doubt, um, you know, taking over the the Conjuring, you know, main franchise. I mean, these are big shoes to fill. I think I said, mm -hmm. said it to you. I mean, this is, you know, this is a franchise that was started by, by James, you know, James Wan, master of horror. Um, you know, I'm a huge fan of his and, you know, honestly coming into it, um, you know, it is. It was a mix of just like the movie. It was uh, both thrilling and terrifying. You know, and <laughs> you know, from the even the moment we first started talking about it, um, I was like, it was a mix of like, oh my god, I might be directing the third Conjuring, <laughs> and then also just like all the fans, wait, James Wan isn't directing the third Conjuring. <laughs> So it's funny, I got that so much like on social media and just so much like, you know, and without a doubt, I mean, like I, I know the hesitation, I know the fear, especially when you have something that, you know, a series that you love and especially a series that, you know, has been so imprinted, you know, by just, you know, one director and one kind of honestly, like, you know, visionary guy. Um, the, I think that, you know, from the very beginning with it, the thing that gave me the most hope and excitement about it is that uh, it was going to be a departure that, you know, yeah. um, you know, in a lot of ways there, you know, from the very beginning, you know, this was going to be more like a supernatural thriller. This was going to be, you mm -hmm. know, we kind of joked around in the beginning, I think just because both James and I love seven, we were like, it's going to be seven for the conjuring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, that was like one of the things that, you know, the idea that we were going to be taking them out of the haunted house, you know, blowing the doors off the, uh, the, the haunted house and um you know taking them in just into different places and i think that that was something that you know i realized you know you know i'll have a chance to kind of you know create you know scares and experiences that are totally different and you know that's what i really looked forward to the most you know going into it um and i think it's also the thing that people really have responded to is you know i think that you know we all like we you know, I think the reason that the franchise kind of, you know, you know, exists is because we all fell in love with that first movie. Mm -hmm. And in a way that has been both, you know, a, a blessing and a burden. And I think it's what, what it is, is that, you know, 
I think up to this point, there's just the expectation that if you're watching a Conjuring movie, it needs to be a haunted house story. Yeah. And, um, and we kind of like deliver that in a way within those kind of first, you know, 11 minutes that you saw, you know, our, our joke as we were developing it is this is going to be Conjuring two and a half. We're going to pack an <laughs> entire Conjuring movie into like the opening and then it's going to go horribly wrong. It'll be the Conjuring movie where the Warrens fail, where everything goes wrong and their mm. decisions were wrong. And they guess they, they, you know, and there's something about that, that I loved. And, you know, even especially in the kind of the broader kind of stroke of story that this is, you know, all the Conjuring movies are, are marketed as their darkest case, but this really is their darkest case. I mean, this has a real murder. This is a real tragedy at the center mm. of it. I mean, you can go to Wikipedia and fi find out how it ended up with Arnie. I mean, there's, you know, it's it's hard to like to get again because you know the Warrens and you know the Conjuring experience is so much built around this like it's always a happy ending. They always get it right, and everyone there's no victims. Everyone's happy. The only thing that we, we maybe we have a dead dog and a couple dead birds, but but everything's okay, you know. And this it's not okay, and especially in the world and the year that we just came out of, I think it's important to be able to tell stories where things go wrong and things don't make sense and you got to try and make sense with them out of them. And, and I think that that, of course, we had no idea that this past year was coming before mm. as we started making the movie. <laughs> yeah. But like telling those stories, I think that, and that take on it, I thought that that was like really, that was what I got really excited about when we went into, you know, into making it. And I think that's what people responded to is like all of a sudden, like, Oh my God, I was worried this wasn't going to feel like a classic Conjuring movie, but it's, that's actually been the, the greatest blessing is that it's actually been able to go into these uncharted territories and feel different while still having the heart and soul of the Warrens and, you know, and enough of the kind of the conjuring scares to kind of, you know, you know keep everyone happy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. And, and you mentioned, you know, this coming out in a pandemic year, uh, obviously this, this hit a few delays for release. Did you, um, did you find that that kind of extended time in the editorial room with these delays kind of changed and uh, shifted your film in any way? You know, it did to a degree. I mean, not that significantly. We were going to go back for additional photography right before, right as the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. Like we had, the sets were built, every, everything was ready. And um, we, um, you know, the pandemic hit, we put it on hold, everybody's schedule got screwed up. So we were waiting the entire pandemic. So we had a plan for what we were going to do and we just kind of sat on it. And, you know, there was probably some like minor developments over the course of that time and, you know, minor kind of, you know, tweaks on some scares, but the core story was already there. Mm. Um, it's funny. I probably like, I, I'd love to give like, do another podcast, like post like full spoilers, you know, to kind of talk <laughs> about how those kind of things developed. Mm -hmm. um, but it, uh, it, I guess to answer your question, it didn't, it didn't give us like a fundamental kind of shift. We already kind of knew what we were going to do. It just mm. delayed the movie. Honestly, that was the biggest thing. And then unfortunately it delayed it to the point where we were scrambling to finish, like, you know, to cut what we, what we shot. And so it was wow. just a race to the finish at the end. Oh wow! That, that always just kind of feels insane where you're, when you're sitting around for a year and then you basically have like a month to finish the movie, which, um, you know, definitely was a race. Oh, that's wild. Wow. Well, and you, now when we discussed, when we talked uh, previously, we had talked about the, the aspect of creating a, staying with James Wan's vision and keeping it practical. And I, again, I watched the film again and that, that, that opening sequence, man, that, mm -hmm. that, that, that possession. Now, I don't know if I've told Ryan this, but Ryan, that most of that's not CGI. I can, I want my contortion to talk about stuff? that. That is not CGI, oh, buddy. Oh man, I was one. That was like on my question list because like that contortion is so funky and like impactful, and you do it twice throughout the film. No big spoilers, but like yeah, just the contortion elements in this. That that was practical. All practical. Yeah. So that's Emerald Wolf. She's this. Oh my um, god. This twelve-year-old contortionist. Everything she did there, there's nothing that was sped up. There was nothing because, and it was funny because we even played with speeding some of the stuff up. But I was like, no, it is like it should all be like exactly how it came into the oh, camera. Man. The, the only visual effect is we put Julian's face on her body, but like her doing that kind of that thing twist, like into as she's like he's you know looking at his sister. That's all. That's all in camera. That was her oh, doing man. that. 
her, her like, which, you know, made it to the trailers and it's kind of like the signature thing, that kind of double bend snap. That was all in camera. There's no wires. That was like, also it was, that was the speed she did it at. And it was funny because we had rehearsed it at a slower speed. It was going to be this kind of like, you know, really kind of like creepy aching, like, you know, back bend into that. And we did a few takes and I was like, Emerald, can you give me like an alternate or like, what else can you do? And she's like, I could do it really fast. And she did it at the speed you see it in the movie. And I, everyone on set, and that was like a rehearsal. Everyone on set was like, you could hear them like, oh my God, like it was a <laughs> chill that came through the room. So I was like, that's going to be the one. We're going to do that. Um, but yeah, that's it was all in camera. And I mean, she's just amazing. She's super talented. And um, wow. I think that you can, I don't know. It's, you know, I wonder if, cause you probably could have done that CG and you could have, you, you could have gotten a digital double, you know, to do it. And, and um, we just didn't even kind of open that door. I mean, I think mm -hmm. it, it was honestly, it was just more fun doing it this way. And, you know, I got to give a lot of the credit to, you know, it's the world that James set up where it's like, it's, you know, it's a universe that kind of, there's the expectation and the value of practical effects. And I think so much so that, you know, people even have an allergy to it where like in, you know, the Crooked Man, all in camera, but then there was this kind of strange uproar online that was like, oh no, that's CG and we have, we reject that. That doesn't like, you know, it was just funny how that was where, I mean, that was a feat. I mean, the Crooked Man is amazing that that's all mm. in camera. Um, so uh, yeah, credit goes to, you know, James for setting it up and the new line from, for continuing that tradition and supporting it. Cause I, I'm sure there's a lot of studios that would just say, you know, why waste the time? Why do it? And it's just, the answer is it's more fun. That's amazing. You know, viewers can feel it in their core. I feel when something is done for real, you can you can just tell in a guttural level as an audience. So like kudos for keeping that practical. Oh, yeah. Thanks. What are some of the other challenges? I, I, obviously, you know, choosing to go the more practical effect with the possession and, and, and getting the contortionist. What were some of the more challenging uh, story arc structures? What what was problematic for you that you kind of had to jump in and figure out how to do? Because there's some really mm. interesting things and some interesting chances you take here, which I really liked. But it seems like it was a little challenging to kind of go this route. I think that the, the biggest, most obvious, you know, thing that I, you know, was a trick to, to navigate was the actual murder. And you know, being respectful about that and truthful and um, while still making it thrilling. And, you know, I, it was, I think everybody was, you know, everyone was excited about this. Like this case was, you know, definitely, I think that, you know, there's something kind of like very sticky about it and very, you can, you can see as like, and you can see as the marketing plan campaign plays out is, you know, the, you know, going on, you know, taking the devil on trial, you know, taking your kind of this kind of almost faith on trial, like that is really captivating to a lot of people. Um, so from the very beginning, everyone was like this, you know, the studio and James and the whole team was really excited about that. I think we were also equally and even more so concerned and even terrified on how do we handle the murder? You know, how, how do we, you know, because we're, we're telling the story of the Warrens first and foremost, and we need to honor that and what they believe and what they experience. And then we're also telling the story of Arnie, who is a man who was, went to trial for murder. And, um, you know, how do we, you know, there's a real victim in it and how are we, how do we treat it respectfully and how do we handle that? And, you know, that was something that, you know, you know, even kind of how we depict the murder, the murder was, um, you know, there's some things that are kind of very close to what happened. And then there's, there's other things that we, you know, we just chose to, to leave out because it, you know, it, it made our victim look worse or bad or, you know, there's things, I think it was, you know, so much of that. And it's, you know, that's, it's not really the most interesting of like, you know, kind of behind the scenes horror talk, but it was honestly the thing that kind of would keep me up at night. It's just like, you know, I want to make an awesome Conjuring movie. I want to deliver for the fans. I always also want to be respectful of the truth and the true victim in the story. And, and, you know, how do you navigate that? Because I think that what's exciting and scary is, you know, up to this point with the Conjuring movies and a lot of supernatural movies is you can kind of go into it and you can playfully have that thought experiment about your own personal beliefs. And I was, I think I told you this, you know, James, when we, uh, we first, uh, we sat down is, 
I grew up Catholic. Um, and, you know, I have my own set of beliefs. I'm, I'm not practicing anymore. But, you know, you kind of go into these movies like, you know, you know, kind of play, playfully thinking like maybe it was real, maybe it wasn't real, what part was real. But all of a sudden when you have a real victim, a man on trial, his life is, in, in, you know, hanging in the balance. I think that, you know, those questions start to have a lot more weight. And even when people have asked me, you know, what do I really believe about this case? I think, you know, it's not just, I can't playfully entertain, you know, an answer. I have to be very thoughtful, you know, in, in what I say. And I, I think also just navigating that in the movie was one of the biggest tricks. I, I really think you did strike a balance in this between like the elements we expect of a Conjuring film and respecting the people involved. Um, like in your in your prep work for this film, were you able to talk with any of the real people who were a part of this? You know, I didn't. Um, I didn't actually get to our uh, our writer uh, DLJ David Leslie Johnson did you know a bunch of interviews mm. with uh, with Arnie and Debbie, and you know he went through transcripts and you know both of the accounts of the murder and then also the accounts of the exorcism. And um, I mean, and there's things that were really, you know, fascinating, extraordinary things that didn't even make it into the, into the movie. And it was kind of a, you know, it's like a balance. It's funny because I think a lot of times you just assume that it's like, we're going to take a very loose story and we're going to like, you know, just kind of scare it up and we're going to kind of come up <laughs> with these kind of fantastic things to put into it. But then there's like, you know, there was, Everyone who was present at the the exorcism, including the priests, like say that David levitated a foot off the uh, uh, off the table, and oh. um, you know that was something that was you know it's it's boring. But I was like, I don't know if we're going to do levitation. I think I, I think mm -hmm. we could do something a little bit more visceral and unsettling because mm -hmm. I think levitation is a little like we've seen it before, and that so it's things like that. There's so many of those little details that you know we didn't we actually were extraordinary that we didn't, that didn't make it into the, into the movie, but just because of like, you know, a creative choice. Now, I love that. And I love the fact that we, and we talked uh, when we spoke about the exorcist, there are a few moments uh, that you, you definitely, I, I get the whole homage thing, especially that opening shot. At yeah. The there was a visual callback in there. I was like, just mm -hmm. so cool. Were there <laughs> other, like how, as a filmmaker, do you like to kind of take those moments of, of movies that have inspired you and kind of play, pay a little tribute to them? Yeah. I mean, without a doubt, I mean, obviously, you know, this movie, I mean, I think the first, you know, the first, uh, I think all the Conjuring movies are these love letters to horror. I think it's a conversation within the genre, you know, and to the genre. And, you know, so um, I think that, you know, with this, definitely I wanted to wear some of it on, on my sleeve, uh, you know, we talked about, um, you know, the, uh, the nightmare influences, the, uh, nightmare on Elm street Four influences. And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, um, and, uh, I, I think that that was something that like, you know, I mean, you can't do a waterbed scare without like, you know, kind of looking at that movie. Um, <laughs> and so I think that there was kind of a lot of little bits like that, where I was like, you know, I think it's, you know, it's fun to have that conversation. I think it's like, it's a conversation, you know, within, you know, you know, almost between the movies themselves and, you know, so, and also of course with fans, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that definitely something I noticed in this film is a, a very deep kind of attention to detail too is, you know, for example, the, um, the, the color contrasts you use between like the sepia tones with the Warrens and like blue tints during some of the exorcisms uh, could you kind of go into the process of choosing your aesthetic for this film? Um, yeah, you know, a lot of it was, um, it's a good question. Yeah, I think, <laughs> that, you know, we wanted to, I wanted to use color in a really targeted way. And I also wanted to use light in a really targeted way. So mm. it would you know, it would mean something, you know, either specifically, literally, or it would mean something, you know, emotionally. And, um, you know, without a doubt, you know, there's, you know, red is one of the recurring, you know, colors in the movie. And, you know, mm -hmm. it's definitely associated with the curse. You know, also just, you know, I, I love, I love interactive lighting. I love moving lighting. Um, you know, as simple as like, I love it when lights move through the frame, you know, there's something about it, like yeah. you know, whether it's car lights or whatever <laughs> it is. And I think that, you know, I was wanted to kind of play it almost like music where you're kind of like, 
you're, you're using it in a really targeted way, you know, and there's, you know, the most kind of obvious dramatic point was on the, you know, in the, in the forest where she, you know, connects to the, the past event and there's that dramatic lighting change. And that was all in camera. That was, there was no visual effects there. Really? Um, and that was, mm-hmm. we shot it at night and we got a giant light and we put it on a techno crane and track huh. and we, we lit it to look like, like day. And we're kind of, you know, shooting down and then we just kind of set the sun, we basically move that light dramatically through the woods. And it, it gives this effect, like, you know, the, the sun is setting and, um, hmm. And, you know, I just thought like, you know, one, I just love to see lights move, but I thought that there was something really captivating about that where you just kind of, you know, you could feel this transition, you know, as she's kind of going into this other place. And, um, and it, you know, I, I, there was also like other moments where we used it where, you know, like when they're in the motel and like, I, I really loved the, you know, there's a little bit of like some Hitchcock references. Of course, the obvious one is like, you know, with Psycho in the very beginning with the shower and then mother in the window. But then there's other kind of more subtle Hitchcock references with a little bit of like vertigo and a little bit of like North by Northwest. And, you know, in the motel, I was, I I love the idea of just, you know, injecting green into the window, Um, you know, to kind of give this like her kind of connection. you know, to the past, to that kind of that other side. And um, and then the other thing I wanted to play with is just like those kind of car lights as they're going by. And as she's kind of telling her story, you know, where I think we, we toyed with the idea of like flashing back to, to the exorcism as she's kind of recalling back what happened in the exorcism. Mm-hmm. But I think that that was a moment where I just thought like, it would be cooler if we just feel these like these moving lights, these little flickers of light as almost like, it's like her memory is kind of sweeping through the room. And then, and then it, we're on Ed as he's kind of like listening and then the, the kind of the lights pass. And I was just like, I just thought that that, that really conveyed that feeling of memory where it's just kind of, it kind of surges and passes and, and, but it's not as explicit. Like you're listening to her tell the story, like you experienced it just like they did. So you can have your own memory that kind of, you know, comes back. One of the things you said a few minutes ago, and I, I think I do want to talk about it is I, I think why these, you know, we, 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 and we did talk a bit, a little bit about this, but why I think people love the Conjuring movies, not just that they're horror, it's a love story. These are all love stories. And this, this is in in a way even more of a love story because they face some challenges with their relationship uh, here without giving things away does that feel different approaching that kind of the more romantic or or or, or loving or caring or the empathetic or the sympathetic beautiful moments that you find between veer and patrick as opposed to delving into the satanism and horror and all that fun stuff (laughs) I think it's, you know, you got to have one with the other. I think that's why these, you know, the series endures. And I think that's one of the reasons that we love the the Warrens is like, we love them. We love going on this journey with them. We love being scared with them. You know, it's, you know, the more that we love them, the more we can get scared, the darker we can go, the more unsettling their cases can be. I think it's, you know, they exist together. Um, I think that they're, you know, if you look back in the first Conjuring, you know, they had a great relationship and a loving relationship. And I think that it's, you know, all of, you know, as the series developed, I think you just see that, you know, stronger and stronger. And I think it's a testament to the chemistry between Patrick and Vera, which is incredible. Mm. And I can say that it's, it's totally legit. They are, they're, you know, we all experience it as we watch the movie on set. They have got just the most awesome friendship. They have got so much of this, this great platonic love, this great friendship, you know, they, they're very different actors. They approach scenes very differently, but they um, they have a tremendous respect for each other. Their families are friends and like, it just like, they feel like family. And I think that that is, you know, something that, you know, you know, has really supercharged the, the you know, the, the series and really makes their love feel even more so legitimate, especially you see the behind the scenes and it's like, they're just like, they're the bestest of friends. Um, yeah, and in terms of like, you know, this, you know, managing that with a story, I think, you know, you know, what I've, as I was kind of struggling to crack this case, you know, like, as if I solved it myself, um, but like, <laughs> it's struggling to like figure out like, what's my angle? What's my belief? What, what do I do? You know, ultimately, you know, I kind of 
came to the, the thinking that, you know, these are always stories about faith and they're always stories about love. And I think sometimes the, the story of faith is not so much the story about our faith in God, but it's the faith that we put in each other. It's the faith that we put in the people that we love and the ch people we choose to be with. And I think that this movie tells that story both with um, the Warrens, you know, and their enduring love and the persistence of their love, even through these, you know, we put them through the ringer, you know what happens. Mm -hmm. um, and and then also, you know, the, they're kind of their mirror couple, the mirror story of, of Arnie and, um, and Debbie. And, you know, they're, you know, they, they remained married up until a few weeks ago when she just passed away from cancer. She, yeah. you know, just coincidentally, you know, she just passed. And um, she was there, you know, they were together through that exorcism. They were there through his, you know, claimed possession, through the murder, through the trial, through him being in jail. Spoiler alert. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> and, you know, all the way and they stayed together. I mean, I think that that is one of the greatest testaments of, of faith is, you know, that they believed in each other and believed in that experience. And I think it's, you know, I, I don't know. It's like, I, as I kind of went into the story, I was kind of, you know, we, we live in such like a, you know, there, there's no gray areas in, you know, in our society anymore. It's, you're, it's either, it's black or white. You're either wrong or right. And like, and everyone believes they are right. And no one is open to a more nuanced, complex answer. And that's what I liked about, you know, at least that's where I thought the, the opportunity here is, is like, you know, we're all going to have a different opinion about what happened. We're all going to have a different interpretation from that. But, you know, the truth and what you can't deny is that, you know, their love persisted and they, st they believed in each other. And that in itself, you know, as we see it in them, we see it in the Warrens. I mean, that's, I mean, that's a powerful message. That's a powerful story. Mm. Now, earlier in our uh, interview, you're kind of talking a little bit about your personal influences, you know, injecting some Nightmare on Elm Street in there, some Exorcist. I kind of want to dive into you as a horror fan and as a director, like growing up, kind of what films influenced you to pursue horror films? You know, I think honestly, like, you know, a lot of like, you know, VHS 80s, you know, horror movies and, you know, starting with with Nightmare and, you know, what's crazy is it's like it might have been the third or fourth one was the first one that I actually saw. And then, mm -hmm. you know, I went back through the series and, um, you know, and I, I enjoy all of those, you know, and that they, you know, it's funny and we were, I think it was before we started, we were talking about New Nightmare and just like, you know, how much fun that was. And uh, I mean, honestly, that's a great series and it really doesn't get the respect that, I think because it may have hung out a little bit too long. It may have been just, you know, there may have been a couple movies that, you know, have gotten kind of, you know, uh, you know, are, you know, that if you go back to the first one, I mean, it's an amazing idea. It's a really powerful idea. And you can oh, see yeah. this, like the resonance in, you know, beyond just horror movies, just in, in, I can see echoes of it in Inception. I'm like, you know, I, I feel like there's so much. I mean, honestly, the, the rotating room. I mean, Nolan is like shamelessly ripping off uh, West Coast. Yeah, yeah, seriously. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's like the dream story. I mean, so much about that. I mean, and, you know, I just think that, that that had a really powerful effect on me. I think that there was, you know, and I think it still does. Um, you know, I think after that, you know, I think about, you know, Poltergeist had a big impact. And I think one of my favorites and still is to this day is Aliens. I think yeah. Aliens is just so rock solid awesome. It is, you know, I love sci-fi and I love horror and it is this beautiful blend of the two. Um, it is, the Space Marines are so awesome. That was the first time I ever heard of Space Marines and I <laughs> whatever. Now Space Marines, it's like, you have video games, it's like, you know, everything. It's like Space Marines are everywhere. But that was like, honestly, the first time I ever heard of Space Marines. Um, <laughs> The power loader sequence, there's so many sequences in that that are so rock solid and just mm -hmm. really fantastic. And at the core, what a great emotional story of just, you know, a mother and a daughter. I mean, essentially, you know, with me, you know, I, I just think that that is, you know, I love that movie. I think it's just, it's, it's an absolute beast rock solid. I'll sometimes just like watch clips of it, like when I'm working out just to get all fired up. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, just because, you know, I love it. I think it's just great. Um, I sound like a maniac now talking about that, but <laughs> nah, um, nah, nah. the, uh, I don't know what, you know, the other, the other things, you know, I think going into, you know, of course, you know, love scream, yeah. love the others. I think the others without a doubt. And, you know, the orphanage, you know, they, there's, there's a big influence 
um, in The Conjuring, you know, in, you know, in going back to The Changeling. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a huge Changeling fan. I came to that actually after The Conjuring. Um, but, you know, I see those similarities and I see that, you know, you know, I do love that kind of atmospheric, you know, brand of horror that, um, you know, I don't know. It's it's what I love about horror is it's such a big tent. You know, there's so much that can really fit in it. And, um, you know, even between, you know, Aliens, Nightmare, Conjuring. I mean, it's, you know, these are, you know, vastly different experiences, vastly different movies. And, you know, they kind of, you know, have different things that they work, but it's, um, you know, they're all like, they're all great thrill rides. I think that that's, you know, I think that's one of the things I always just come back to is like, and, you know, they're great. I mean, even like, even though it's not classically considered a horror movie, I love Jurassic Park. I you remember seeing that in Terminator yeah. 2, like with my dad in, in theaters and like, that had a big impact on me. And I was just like, you know, I, you know, it's the thrill ride nature that you get out of a horror movie is, is, you know, something I, I really love. And, you know, I think that that's honestly why, you know, as we're getting this really, um, you know, movies are kind of in this kind of existential or the theatrical experience is in a, this existential crisis. Um, I think that's why horror movies are really kind of coming to the forefront and you see so much um, with them is just, they work, they work in this fundamental level. Mm -hmm. Now, one, one thing I want, I, I, you know, as you're talking about your favorite movies and, and I, I agree with a lot of those, although The Changeling, give another chance. It's an amazing movie. <laughs> oh no, I, I love The Changeling. <laughs> okay. I, I had not seen it before, like I, just as the way things had evolved. You scared like, me, Michael. <laughs> you scared me. I love it. No, it's a masterpiece. It's a full on masterpiece. Oh, no, <laughs> totally. I just hadn't seen it before I saw The Conjuring, which I'm a little bit embarrassed. <laughs> kind of like, come to certain, you know, movies and series kind of like out of order. You know, I think that was just the, you know, the way. <laughs> Yeah, I well, yeah. I, I was wondering, does you know, growing up Catholic, I, I kind of grew up pretty much nothing. Growing up Catholic, Catholic, does that kind of, I don't know, color your shading of of the the, the movies you want, the what scares you, what? Because I I'm, I know I think we are all kind of I don't know freaked out by things that freaked us out as children. Uh, mm -hmm. Did did that affect any in any way though your love of horror? I think to a degree, I think it's one of the reasons that, you know, I don't know if I'm just more a believer. It's funny because I'm both a skeptic and a true believer. Like I, mm -hmm. I go back and forth where I, um, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm a man of science. I'm very analytical. I reject any of that like mumbo jumbo. But then sometimes I am just, I'm the most like, I want to believe like, you know. Yeah. Well, you need to, and you know, so this show, Sound Scary, was started as a, you know, we were start, we started on a, a, a paranormal loving channel. Uh, Ryan and I have done ghost hunts. We've done several, actually, and we've caught some really strange things. Have you ever done anything like that? Have you ever been on a ghost hunt? I have not been on a ghost hunt. I've got to go, guys. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Let's go find a ghost house. I'm You're formally out. invited. Okay, here's the deal. When things start settling and when you can talk about this film, let's do a special episode of this with you. We'll do a ghost hunt. We'll mix it all up. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm easily scared. I think that's one of the things it should be warned. I will be <laughs> treating like a girl. Perfect. I love I'm it. Edit some of that stuff out. Like, you know, I could do another take with, with a more measured response, but I will be the first one screaming. <laughs> awesome. Oh, I love it. It makes for good content. It's funny. Uh, is it difficult kind of doing press and kind of going in, oh, I, we, I got to talk about the movie, but you can't talk a lot about mm. this film. I mean, it would give away so much. Is that kind of a, a that seems like a bit of a problematic thing, that, a, a, a nice problem to have, albeit, but it seems like problematic. Thankfully, none of the interviews ever go this long. I think we're in like uncharted te territory. You're oh, like no. in the longest interview. <laughs> <laughs> we're honored. So I'm going to be like, I'm going to start spilling my guts. It's going to, I'm going to get into dangerous territory. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. I, I feel like there is so many interesting things to talk about with a movie that we haven't really gotten into. I haven't had to dodge too many questions. Honestly, wherever I, I always feel like there's an artful dodge or I'm always trying to kind of choose my words wisely is when it actually comes to the murder and my belief of what happened and, you know, uh, 
but you know, we, we never really, uh, you know, also I think up to this point, you know, not many people had seen the movie. So, yeah. you know, you were kind of working off of like a lot of the questions were just, you know, the top line, you know, the case, what's it like to work with Patrick and Vera, which was, you know, easy. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's, I'm excited. I, I've seen the movie twice in theaters with, um, you know, in, in uh, where, where we tested it. Mm -hmm. And it was really fun to see. And it was really fun to just see people's, because, you know, you're going in. I think that that was actually the best opportunity is, you know, you have fans that are going in with an expectation and, and, and thinking they know what's going to happen. And, you know, as things take their turns and as things, you know, evolve, it was really funny, fun to, like, feel that in the theater, to actually just, like, to feel like you could you could hear people making like sounds like they were like mm -hmm. like they were kind of getting ahead of things and it was like oh yes and it was what I loved is it's like that was there's moments in there which are unlike anything in a conjuring movie and there's even mm -hmm. a couple scenes like there's you know one scene in particular where it's was always people's favorite scene and we actually like I think in there was like a South American film festival where New Line actually played the scene as a tease and it never got out anywhere else. Mm. And it was late in the movie, but we stopped doing it because when you just show that one scene, people are like, wait a second, this is so different. This is, they would almost reject it. Yeah. But because you were kind of uh -huh. taking these baby steps, like kind of into this uncharted territory that like when you get to it in the, in the, you know, when you're actually watching the movie, I think people are really like excited for it. And I think that it was, and I think that that was cause it's a long way of saying, you know, like a lot of times the trailer will just kind of give away all the cool stuff. But I was so happy when I saw those trailers and I was like, this is great that they're not even digging into, you know, one of the, the, the scenes that tested the highest, the scenes that people love the most mm -hmm. um, isn't even anywhere in the, the trailer. So I think that just like that sense of surprise, I think was really, you know, really fun. And you had mentioned before we started the interview that that you're a big movie trailer guy. And you know, that that's such an important thing I feel is not giving away too much. And it, you, the trailer for this movie, I personally feel is pretty good. Um, I remember being at the theater for the first time, they showed it before Mortal Kombat. And the second like people realized it was a Conjuring movie, I heard someone go, ooh, <laughs> like you, you guys just have this built in aura about your films, but Kind of touching on trailers a little bit more um what are some that you personally love because you told me that you keep a playlist what are some of the trailers that like really stuck with you i um yeah let me think about that the honestly i um i think we have an awesome trailer i'm really proud of it i think that the team behind it did a really great job um and i think also in just doing something that captures the experience and gets fans excited but also as I said, doesn't give away some of the coolest stuff in the movie. Um, there was literally a scene that everyone was like, we have to, it's just honestly, it's like this this one shot that everyone was like, we gotta put that in the, the, the trailer. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad it didn't go in the trailer because it would have been a huge, well, potential spoiler. <laughs> yeah, long-winded way of saying, I mean, honestly, I think trailers are, you know, I love trailers. I'm a big movie fan. I'm a big movie nerd, as you guys are getting a sense of with, you know, my YouTube, um, you know, trailer <laughs> list. And I think trailers- Sorry are, to call you out there. <laughs> oh, dude, honestly. Um, I think trailers are like this essential part of the storytelling process. I think that they're actually in this, in a way, they're almost like the first act of the movie. And, you know, it's because, you know, love them or hate them, you know, they- exist in our culture where that's our first kind of glimpse at the story our first glimpse of the storytelling and i think that filmmakers need to embrace it and need to kind of like you know acknowledge that that is what audiences are coming into the movie with so if you're seeing the trailer and you've seen the movie and you are basically waiting for an hour to get to catch up with the trailer you're going to be a very frustrated audience member and mm -hmm. I think that, you know, acknowledging that, because I know that I've had that experience. I'm like, okay, when are we going to get to the scene? When are we, okay, I got it. I got it. I get, when right. are we going to get to, like, you, you get frustrated because you've been spoiled by, by the trailer. And I think that, you know, part of that is, I mean, at the point that the trailer gets made, it is, you know, a little bit of the, um, you know, 
hopefully the trailer company is being respectful and, you know, not telling too much of the story, but I think there is a little bit of a dance there. And, you know, in an ideal world, it'd be awesome if we could make the trailers like in parallel to the movie so that they mm. actually, you know, they give you that, like, that first glimpse or that kind of act zero, you know, glimpse at the movie, you know, before it's even started. Cause I think that, you know, that's, you know, before this, I was, you know, directing TV commercials and, you know, I think advertising and, you know, it really, there is a storytelling opportunity there. And I think that we can start telling stories earlier in the trailers and kind of like seeding ideas and then playing with expectations. And I think that there's, there's probably opportunities that haven't even been tapped in yet. Um, where it just, you get a better collaboration with these, you know, trailer companies. And that's a long-winded way of, you know, <laughs> long-winded answer about trailers. In terms of my <laughs> favorite trailers, um, you know, it's a long list and there's, uh, you know, it doesn't go back that deep because trailers pretty, uh, age pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, honestly, one of the oldest trailers that I have on my list that I go back to all the time is the, the Suicide Squad trailer. And um, I'm blanking on exactly what, and I've seen it a million times, but like, <laughs> I think that that's just a great testament for, um, I mean, there, there was a lot of great trailer work in that. I think the movie's mm -hmm. a, you know, a solid movie. It's an imperfect movie. You know, a lot of people like to mm -hmm. tear that movie down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the trailers were really amazing in capturing this kind of spirit of, of the movie. Um, I think that that's a, uh, you know, it always just impressed me. And especially like having seen the movie and then kind of going back to it, it, you know, there was this great promise and, you know, I, you know, I don't know. I think that that is so much of the movie and the success of the movie gets defined in that opening weekend. You know, when the movie is first released, mm -hmm. you know, it, you know, basically within the first day, you know, your judgment has been sealed. Like you, they know if you're going to be a success or not. And um, which kind of stinks because there used to be a time when you know movies would play long like they'd be in theaters for months and months and then you'd have discoveries and like this is like back in like the miramax days and where you there would be like or the independent i guess you can't call them miramax days but the independent movie days of the like 90s and early 2000s where you would have movies that would get discovered and you know they would evolve but now it's like it's all on that first weekend that's really defined by that first day and um, you either work or you don't, you're a success or you don't, and then you disappear because the next movie's coming in hot the next weekend. And it's it's so jam packed that you don't really get those great discoveries. And so it just comes back to the trailer. You better have a really good trailer. You better have stuff that like, you know, people are really excited to see and, and um, yeah. I want to jump in on the trailer thing because I, I, I'm going to comment on a couple of trailers, not not only your film, but uh, The Quiet Place 2, which mm. I just I just saw and I can talk about because it's open. What they both do is they both tell a lot of the beginning of the story, a lot of it. And that's they don't give anything away. They I with both films, I walked in surprised to as what I was about to see with The Conjuring 3. I was like oh shit they're going there oh my god i i had no expectation of that and it's even you know being a press person i don't know how how much you were involved michael like i had a woman come to my door with a black rose you know delivering a black rose for this movie a couple what? weeks ago i had no idea what was going on it was weird and i love that but i, I love how movies can do that you can a good trailer doesn't need to give the whole movie away. A good trailer needs to just take a, a little sliver of it. And that that's how you get people involved. I always look at the Blair Witch Project. Like, literally, just that, that first trailer that they released is just, oh my god, oh my god, oh, you know, very creepy, unnerving. You don't know what's going on. I love that. I miss that. I wish we did that more often. Yeah, it is such a dance, you know, because I think everybody, you know, I, I think everybody loves that as an ideal, you know, mm -hmm. you know, behind the scenes, you know, fans, like everybody, you know, everybody loves like, you know, the idea of holding back and just like hoping that audiences will be, you know, will want to come, but I don't know. It's just a balance. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm glad that it's, uh, you know, there's such a great marketing team, you know, at Warner brothers that, you know, they have so much, you know, expertise and just smarts in terms of, and just really experience. I mean, they're like, yeah. honestly, it's, it's the part of filmmaking that you never like really think about, mm -hmm. but they are telling the movie, they're telling the story, 
you know, just as much as you are, you know, and, and they are getting the word out and shaping the experience. Um, it is funny. They did uh, the, they, they sent the, uh, the occultist with the rose to, to my door also, but I was like, please just leave the rose. I have two little kids, two very young kids. We're going to get freaked out if I open the door and there's some creepy woman here. Um, oh man. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I, I think that it's, it is tricky. Yeah. And, you know, I'm excited for, uh, you know, it's like, you can't really talk about the competition. It seems like sometimes, but like, I'm excited for Quiet Place too. I'm excited for like all the, I mean, I was looking at the, the lineup of all the movies coming out this summer and like, and there's a ton of horror movies and I'm like, I love this. I am so happy to see like, like, I can't wait to see Escape Room 2. That looks awesome. Oh, me too. <laughs> like, I love the first one. I was like, this is going to be great. It was a pleasant yes. surprise. So I wanted to kind of get back into the the true elements of the film, specifically how this and the other Conjuring movies are based on, you know, the case files of Ed and Lorraine Warren. Um, kind of you as a director, uh, how do you approach the balance of crafting this ongoing um, cinematic version of these real people and balancing that with who they were in real life, these people that the viewers may not otherwise know if it weren't for the films? Yeah, I think that they, you know, it's it's a team effort um, in terms of, you know, representing and shaping them. I, I do think that there are, you know, in some ways they're beloved characters, you know, in, in terms of like the real historical characters of Ed and Lorraine Warren. Mm -hmm. um, one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't get to meet Lorraine. You know, basically when I was hired on the movie, I was like, I cannot wait to meet Lorraine Warren. And we were scheduling it and got yeah. to play and, and then she passed away. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like I've gotten to know Lorraine through Vera, you know, from the very beginning, you know, what I haven't even gotten into, and I'll just keep it quick, but, you know, Patrick and Vera are freaking amazing. They are oh, just yeah. the best people, the best actors, and just, just great people and so fun to work with and so, just so warm. Every day was like hanging out with, you know, friends. Um, mm -hmm. The, uh, what, what Vera told me is from the very beginning, she she said she wanted to approach this like a biopic, that she wanted to be absolutely true to Lorraine Warren. And she says that, and I'm like, totally makes sense. She even went on to say how, you know, the very beginning where she was, you know, presenting the look, like we all accept, you know, how Lorraine looks and dresses and, you mm -hmm. know, her hair and everything. She presented that to the producers and the team, and there was a lot of concern. And there was, a, you know, everyone was, was worried that it was too extreme, that it wasn't relatable. And she stood her ground and she said, this is what Lorraine Warren looks like. And um, I, I love that. And I love the look of Lorraine. I feel like that is some, one of the things that makes it feel so authentic. Um, and I think that, you know, she was that kind of the first, you know, she took that first stand in the very beginning of like, she's gonna be true to these characters. Mm -hmm. But as the stories have evolved, as the movies have evolved, I think that, you know, naturally, you know, Vera, her spirit comes in, Patrick's spirit comes in, they become the movie versions of them um, because they're they're beloved, but they're also controversial. There's some people who say they're charlatans. There's some people who, who are skeptics and really don't believe in the work that they were doing. And, um, and so I, I think that, um, you know, and who's to say, you know, we weren't there, you know, but I, I, you know, we're telling ultimately the Warren stories. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think that, um, you know, I guess the, the quick answer is, you know, it is, you know, it's, you know, there is no quick answer. Yeah. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> oh man, Michael, it, it's such a pleasure. Like you're, you're such a great guy. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you could do this. And do you have a, a scary story you want to tell? I know we talked a little bit about one actually. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to talk about that or do you have something else you want to talk about? Yeah, I mean, I would just say, I mean, for the podcast, I mean, what I told you before, you know, because the question always comes up, like, what was the creepy thing that happened on set? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times it's like, you know, and, and I think that, you know, you usually on, you know, scary movie sets, there's always like something weird that happens. And, you know, maybe there's an explanation, maybe not. Um, and, you know, there was weird stuff that happened on La Llorona that people had experienced. And, you know, I, I, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't a part of them, the the one thing that we ex we all experienced on on Conjuring was um, the during the exorcism. So the exorcism at the very end of the movie, there is you know true Conjuring form. We show the real people, the the pictures, 
And we also play the actual recording of the exorcism of David Glatzel. This is a Catholic approved exorcism. And the basis of that, you know, that scene. And um, before we shot it, you know, we got into the into the dining room and got all the actors together. And, um, or, you know, the majority of the actors that were gonna, you know, portray the scene. And I thought, you know, okay, this is gonna be a really cool director move. I'm gonna play the actual like recording of the exorcism just to get everyone in the, you know, in the zone, you know? It's like, that's gonna, it's probably what James would do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I thought like, hey, you know, this is, this could be really powerful. I, I had heard the recording before and it's, you guys have heard it, it's super unsettling. Yeah. yeah. And um, I, I thought this would be a good way to set the mood. And it, um, we played it, and you know it's different than you know over the end credits because the end credits you have the kind of that classic Joe Bashar score which is so like moody and stuff. Mm. Um, but when you just play it and you just hear those voices and hear what David was going through, it's deeply unsettling. And especially when there's nothing there, it's just bare, and you have a bunch of people standing around and listening to it, and you're looking at these people, and it's that quiet moment. You know, we're not quiet because we have the tape playing, but it's the, you know, you, you know, you're, it's starting to kind of set into everyone. I think everyone, of course, is excited to make a movie and excited to be on set and there's a lot of energy. But then when you hear that, you know, who's to say what exactly happened there, but you cannot listen to that tape and deny that there was something horrific going on in that family. And, um, and I think that when you, we all listen to it, and we were like looking around at each other and there was people who were like making eye contact with each other. And just like, it was starting to sink in. You could just feel the temperature in the room just shift. Like it just, it, it was really unsettling and really powerful. And um, it's a feeling it's like hard to describe because it's not like, ah, oh, the door slammed all of a sudden, boom, you know? It was just something you could feel like, you know, we're doing this. We're like really recreating something that really had this like, left this like, emotional trauma on this family and you know it you know it, i thought it was very powerful it was a very powerful moment and i think you know other people who were there really you know i don't know it really it it le le left a uh, an impact on us well dude yeah michael thank you thank you Seriously, so much for joining such a us. blast talking with you yeah, yeah thank you guys honestly. this has been so much fun and we both really loved does. the movie. We encourage everyone to go check it out. But it's not like people aren't going to go see it. It's The Conjuring 3. Come on. Come on. June 4th, <laughs> I believe. June 4th, we're looking at HBO June Max and theaters. People exactly. won't be disappointed. It was such a blast. Yes. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. This has been a blast. Yes. Thank you.